during this time, we've been in a, a series called Grow. How many of you guys have been here for the Grow series? Awesome. Grow is a series all about the vision of Heart of the City Church, where we're headed, how we are growing in the Lord, how, how, what our mission is to continue to grow in the purposes and the plans and all the things that God has commissioned Heart of the City Church to do. Now, our mission statement, many of you probably know, has always been and will continue to be, to be a people after God's own heart. Can you guys say that with me? To be a people after God's own heart. That sounds great. I love it. It's an amazing mission statement, but what does it mean? We've decided over these next few weeks, or actually the, the past few weeks, along with the next few weeks, that we have been wanting to clarify and define what that means for us. To us, to be a people after God's own heart can be summed up in four statements. Do you guys remember those? Those that might be a little bit harder. That is to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And now it's going to pop up right here as a... Yeah. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. That's what we've been talking about for the past few weeks. Let me encourage you. If you have missed any of those, you haven't caught them online or been here, please go listen to those. It's, it's, these are pivotal messages that are casting vision for where we are headed, and we want to all be on the same page as a church family. Amen. I would just really encourage you to go check them out. Today, we're going to talk about the third statement, and that is discover purpose, discover purpose. Now, I believe that God kind of downloaded this week, kind of shared with me a, a structure for purpose, and it has three layers or three realms of purpose that I want to talk about, but I want to talk about them through the lens of three scriptures. So our primary texts today are going to be found in Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 4, and in Psalm 139. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 4 and Psalm 139. Each scripture passage coinciding with one of these layers or realms of purpose that I felt like the Lord showed me this week. <clears throat> Giving a little bit of context for Ephesians before we jump into it, this is one of the letters that Paul wrote. How many of you guys know that, that a, a large portion of the New Testament is made up of letters written from Paul to different churches. This is one of those letters. Um, the church of Ephesus was found, well, in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a really important city during that time. It was in Asia Minor. Now, nowadays, we would say Turkey. We don't say Asia Minor anymore, Turkey. But it was, a, it was a hub city for trade. Not only the trade of goods and services, but also information. The reason that's so important to the early church was because the kind of information that can be shared at a trade hub includes the gospel of Jesus. And so Ephesus was a very important city to the spreading of the gospel in the early church. It's really interesting when we look at this particular letter. A lot of Paul's letters, they start with or they at least include a passage of correction where he lovingly rebukes the church of a particular city for something they've been doing, something that needs to change in order for them to operate in the full health and then the full calling of what they were supposed to do. In this letter, however, it doesn't really come across very correctional. Instead, he explains a deep, the deeper purpose of what the church is, has been created for. As we, as we read the book of Ephesians, we'll see it kind of in a progression of him describing us being reconciled to God, very important, and then in turn, us being reconciled to each other as the church and us fulfilling our destiny. Not only our destiny as a church in our physical life here, but he really talks about the church's purpose in what I would call the, the narrative of eternity. The narrative of eternity. And I know that might sound like kind of a strange term, but what I mean by that is basically the church's purpose in the whole big picture. Not just the history of the US, not even just the history of Earth, not even just the history of the solar system or all those things, but the narrative of eternity from beginning to end. Paul is unpacking the eternal purpose and destiny of the church. So I know that some of that might be kind of lofty. I get it. It is for me too. But why don't we jump into Ephesians chapter 1 and let's look at what God has to say for us today. So we're going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we, so beloved there is, is Jesus Christ. We're, we're in Christ. He's blessed us in Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. It's a lot there. It's a very long sentence. But I want to continue on to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not going to give any more context. We already know what Ephesians is. Chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11. It is going to be on the Sky Bible. But I like following along. I can hear the pages. It's very encouraging. You guys are engaged. Wonderful. Starting in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up of the... Of, I'm sorry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ." from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In the third passage, we're going to look at Psalm 139. The Psalms, they are a collection of poetry and songs. A lot of them are meant to be sung, said, or sung to music. When we read them in English, they might not seem that poetic, but they're not written for English, and so that's why it's that way. Um, now, there are several, there are a few different authors in the Psalms, but one, the, the major author of the Psalms that we think about is David, King David. And Psalm 39, I'm sorry, Psalm 139 is one of those Psalms of David. If I had to talk about a general theme for this passage, for this chapter, it would be the depth to which God knows us and the intricacy with which he has designed us and planned our lives. Okay, we're going to start in verse 13. Now, I usually teach out of the ESV. I, I do want to read out of the NLT right now because of the way that it hit me this week. The words that are used here are, I think you'll feel it. Verse 13, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. You guys pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth that we can learn, that we can receive, that we can be transformed by your word, Lord. We thank you that we could gather together like this without fear of persecution or harm to us. We could join together as a family. Today we pray that your truth would be elevated and would transform each one of us from the inside out. Anything that I share that is not your truth, Lord, I pray it would fall to the ground and be forgotten. But that your truth would stand and be planted deep in our hearts so that we might draw closer to you. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So, like I said a few moments ago, I felt like God gave me this three-part structure of purpose. And that it's displayed in these three scriptures that we just read from Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians Four and Psalm 139. But I want to give a little bit of explanation by what I mean by these things before we go to those scriptures. So the three elements or the three layers, realms of purpose that I want to talk about today are universal purpose, focused purpose, 
and individual purpose. I'll say that again. Universal purpose, focused purpose, and individual purpose. Now, when I say universal, no one gets scared. I'm not talking about universalism. It's a very different thing. Simply what I mean is that it is a purpose or it is the way that every believer, that the entirety of the church has been designed. Okay, as an example, all believers were designed to love God and love people. Amen? That's a part of our universal purpose as the church. All believers were designed to make disciples. Amen? Amen? Amen. That means me, that means you. So it is, it is this purpose that applies to all believers, to the entirety of the church. The second one, focused purpose. So this would be what I would call the type or the lane or the theme of your design. Often this is expressed, or this would be expressed in gifts and passions. Okay, gifts and passions. Now, examples of this, I think Craig has been designed to teach. I think Connor has been designed to shepherd. My wife has been designed to give wise counsel. Topher has been designed to create and to perform. Now, I'm not meaning any of these to be all-inclusive and the only thing that they're meant to do, but I think if you were to talk and get to know each one of these people, you would find those statements to be true about their design, about their theme or their lane or the type of their design. And then the third one, our individual purpose, is the one-of-a-kind design built to accomplish your specific mission in life. And I think the best example that I can give for that would be my understanding of my, my individual purpose, my specific design. I believe that I have been designed, that my individual purpose, or at least a big part of it, is to see the city of Coeur d'Alene transformed, to see it turned upside down for the kingdom of God by leading people into intimate, revelatory encounters with his manifested presence through creative worship expression. Now, amen. Now, I know that might sound kind of wordy, and you go, well, why'd you use a bunch of words? Are you trying to sound smart? No, what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to explain is that the way that God thinks about you is more wordy than that. His design for you is way more intricate than a few vocab words. Way more intricate. I am not even scratching the surface when I describe myself that way, scratching the surface of God's thoughts toward me and his purpose for me. And, I wouldn't, and if I tried to do it for you, I wouldn't even be able to come close. That is how intricately he has designed each one of us. A universal purpose, a focused purpose, and an individual purpose just for you. So I want to see, not just, now, that, now that we kind of have an idea of what I mean by each of those words, I want to see how they are disp they're displayed in the scriptures. I think Ephesians chapter 1 displays our universal purpose. I'm just going to read again a few passages from the original passage. I, I'm sorry, a few scriptures from the original passage that I read. Starting in verse 4 from Ephesians chapter 1. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So, in the previous gathering, I said sons, and then I paused, and I said, and daughters, because I wanted people to know that it is meant to be inclusive to both genders. But one of our elders came up to me, and he was like, you want to know something cool? And I was like, yes, tell me. He didn't say it like that, but that's basically what he said. <laughs> he doesn't really talk like that. That's how I talk. Um, so it's actually more powerful for me to not say sons and daughters right there, and here's why. Not because it excludes any gender, but because in this culture... When it says adoption as sons, the meaning of a son versus a daughter in that particular culture had to do with inheritance. And a firstborn son or sons in general in that culture were given a different kind of blessing and a different kind of inheritance. And so when I say sons, it's not meant to be exclusive. It's meant to say that over every son and daughter that we are meant for the full inheritance that God has for us as both his male and female children. Amen? I think that's much better than just including and daughters so, so people feel, don't feel excluded. I think that's a much more powerful message speaking to the culture in which this was written. I'm going to continue. Adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Jesus. 
The church in every believer in it, the church in every believer in it was made to glorify God through intimate relationship with him. I'm gonna say that again. The church and every believer in it was designed to glorify God through intimate relationship with him. You'll notice that in that phrase, it doesn't have a lot to do with doing. Most of the time, I think when we think of our purpose, we think, what am I supposed to do? What am I gonna do in this life? But I think that Paul is making an argument that I would tend to agree with, not tend to, I agree with it, that purpose is a lot more of a being than it is a doing. It's a lot more of a being than it is a doing. Now, I don't mean to say that there isn't an element of doing in our purposes. Of course there is. Eventually we've got to get off our butts and do something, right? But the doing has to come from somewhere. It has to be sourced somewhere. And if it's sourced from striving, and if it's sourced from us being able to do things from our own strength, then we're missing the mark of purpose. See, God has not primarily created task completers. He's created sons and daughters. Now, when we look, when we look at the, at the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, especially the teachings of Jesus, we can see that an inherent part of this purpose of being in intimate relationship with him, of walking as sons and daughters, there is an element where we bring other people into that same knowledge. But you'll also remember if you were here two weeks ago when I was sharing about this, that that drawing or that bringing other people into that intimate knowledge is not meant, it's not like this. It's not like, okay, I'm saved and now here's my list of tasks I gotta do because I got saved, here's my mission. But it's more so like this. It's more so we draw so close to him and we find that he is so good that we just have to tell people about dad. It's not meant to be a thing of, oh, I'm saved and now I have this heavy duty. It's I'm saved, I've encountered the most high God, I've stepped into deeper intimacy with him, and thus, I've got to tell people how good my dad is. It has to come from a place, it has to begin with identity, it has to begin with understanding. It's, this is, if you don't get this, all the other purpose things I'm going to teach today are not going to be meaningful for you. They're not going to be important. It starts here, sons and daughters simply glorifying God by being in intimate relationship with him. That's it. That's where it begins. If that's not the foundation, it's a shaky foundation. And all the doings that we go into are, are going to be meaningless. I love the way that one of my favorite worship leaders, his name's Leland Mooring, he uh, is a part of Bethel Music. He says it like this. He says, I am not a singer. I am a son who loves to sing. I love that distinction because it speaks to how primary and how foundational our identity as sons and daughters is to anything that we do. Whatever you do, whether you're a singer or a, a carpenter or a, or a computer designer or whatever it is that you do, you're a son or a daughter who does things. You're not a doer of those things primarily. You're a son or a daughter who happens to do things. And hopefully, if you have an understanding of your sonship, it is from overflow. It has to be from overflow. That's the only way it will be meaningful is if it is from overflow of intimate knowledge of this God. Okay. That's our universal purpose. Let's continue. Focused purpose. Ephesians chapter 4. Okay. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm only going to read verses 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So shepherds there, we, uh, another translation is pastors. You probably will have heard it that way before. And teachers, it's really interesting. That word is actually shepherd teacher. We shorten it to teacher because it's simpler. And, but it's actually a shepherd teacher. So anyway, um, <laughs> to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. We have all been given gifts and passions that God wants to express himself through for his glory, to accomplish his, to accomplish his purposes on earth. Now, I don't want you to be discouraged if you're reading Ephesians chapter 4 and you see apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and you go, I don't feel like any of those because it's not meant to be an exhaustive list. How do we know that? Well, we see, these, we see other passages like this, other lists that have these gifts and these ministries, and none of them have all the ones that the other ones have. 
And so we are led to believe, and many, most biblical scholars would come to the conclusion that these are not exhausted lists, okay? So I'll give you another example from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to help explain what I mean. And maybe I'll talk a little slower too. Sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling jazzed right now. Something about, man, that 11-11, that 11-11 that worship had me like, A, okay? So I started sweating a long time before I came up here. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 8, okay? Yeah, I don't know what that was. That's not a dab. It's just, what is that? <laughs> okay. Verse 8, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Different expressions of this focused purpose. Not meant so much to be a categorization, but simply a lane, like I said before, a lane or a theme by which God has chosen to express himself through. You might remember when I first came back from Brazil, I went to Brazil this past December, and the week after, my, my dad, J.O., senior pastor, had me come up and talk about a revelation that I believe I had received when I was in Brazil. And what I felt like the Lord shared with me while I was there is I was seeing the gifts in display, and I was seeing the gifts in display. And oh my goodness, what a beautiful sight it was to see the body ministering on all cylinders. And that's for us. That's not just for Brazil. That's not just for third world church, second world church, eastern church. That's for the United States. That's for Idaho. That's for Coeur d'Alene. That's for heart of the city church. We were meant to walk in the fullness, friends. And the lie that has been spread, that has been so pervasive for years that all those things, they passed away with the apostles or they passed away a generation after the apostles has kept the church bound and we have lots of bark but little bite. But let me tell you, God is bringing the bite back to the Western church. God is giving us our bite back, and our bite back is walking in the full expression, the fullness of what he has called us to. And I'm telling you, there's, it's going to get uncomfortable. It's going to get uncomfortable. It is. If you look back through those gifts along, along with other lists, it's going to get uncomfortable. It's going to get uncomfortable when come, someone comes up here and believes that they have been given a tongue that's meant for interpretation, and you're going, never seen anything like this on TV. <laughs> But it's a part of the fullness. Don't let it weird you out. Don't let, your, don't, don't let your filter be everything that you've taught in the Western world. Let scripture be your filter that you put everything else through. God was never meant to be something that we criticize from afar and we go, let's see if God fill, fits through all my filters of what I believe goodness to be. God is the source of goodness. He is what defines goodness. The word and God is the filter, not your set of morals and ethics, sorry. The whole my individual belief system thing is a lie. It's a lie. One God, the word, that is the filter. So gifts. <laughs> They're like love languages. Gary Chapman, you know, five love languages, you know, he would say that we, we, express, we express and we receive love through, um, you know, um, quality time, I don't want to say them all. It's going to take too much time. But you guys know <laughs> the five love languages. But here's what I'd say. I, th I don't think that the spiritual gifts are so unlike those. We, like, I'll express love to Logan by, by saying nice things like, oh, you look so handsome today. I love your key necklace. Right? <laughs> Words of affirmation. But the way that God wants to love on you, Logan, is for him to give me a word of knowledge about your life that breaks down every wall so that your heart is softened so he can cut right to the main issue. God expresses his love for his people through one child to another child through these things like words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miracle, miracles, healings. It's not just so that we can celebrate a powerful display. It's so people can be loved and their hearts can be open to the truth of the gospel. We think, how arrogant is it, is it for us to think that we can walk around and we go, well, you know, I know the apostles, they walked in miracles and, and spoke truth. I know that Jesus walked in miracles and spoke truth, but all I need is truth. I don't need miracles. Who told you that? Who told you? 
Jesus and the apostles, it was a partnership. They walked in the supernatural and they spoke the truth of the gospel. They walked in the supernatural and they spoke the truth. That is for us, friends. That's for us. Okay. Let's see, did I say everything? Yeah. We'll go ahead and move on. Individual purpose. Individual purpose, I think, is expressed in Psalm 139. I'm only going to read verse 16 this time. Just let this sink in so deep. This is so rich. This is so good. It's so countercultural. It's so God. This thing, I'm not saying everything I'm saying. I'm not speaking about that. I'm talking about this specific scripture. Psalm 139, 16. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. <laughs> I'm a self-made man. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go create my own destiny or future or whatever those memes say. What a bunch, what a crock. <laughs> he wrote your whole book already. Amen. You want to know why your life maybe feels like, I mean, if it is, feels like it's pulling teeth? Because you're trying to write another book when he's already written one for you. Yeah. He's already written every page before you were born. And we go and we try to do this thing of like ourself and like care for yourself and do what's best for you and all these things that sound really nice, but they're totally anti-scriptural. It's not what God has for you. Of course he wants you to be cared for. Of course he wants you to be loved on. But it's a path that he's already written. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to skip some of this. You know, this, this particular section of purpose, um, I just, I feel like we need to hang here for a minute because I, I believe. So this is, like I said, this is the one of, one of a kind design. One of a kind design. The mission just for you, only for you, only for Aaron Barather. Just for you. That you were born for. No one else can complete it. It's just you. I want to sit on this one for a minute today because I think it's the one where the enemy really digs his teeth into. Now, I think he's trying to steal all of our purpose. I think he is trying to lie to us and say we're not sons and daughters. I think he is trying to lie to us and say we don't have gifts and passions, but a lot of us can accept those things. I can accept that I'm a son or daughter of God. I can accept that I have these gifts and passions, but what makes me me? What makes you unique? Why do you need to bring your thing to the table? And he comes in with these little pervasive lies, and he said, there are 10 people who can do this better than you. Why even try? Someone's already done this. You're not unique. You don't have something fresh to bring. You're just a copy or a carbon copy. Just forget about it. He comes in with these little pervasive lies that we believe, and we call it humility. <laughs> and it's just not. I, I felt like the Lord shared with me this weekend as, we were, as I was preparing, there was going to be people in the 11-11 gathering who have considered and even attempted suicide. And I'm not going to ask anyone to identify themselves. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to put you in that situation. <laughs> if that's you, though, he's speaking right to you today. He made you for a specific purpose that's just for you. You're not a dime a dozen. You have something that he, he wrote a book just for you. Just for you. And what a shame to not see it get written out to the fullness so that we can see the beautiful ending. If that's you, if, 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 that's, if that's where you've been, please don't, please don't do it alone. Please don't think that you have to keep that bottled up. We, we want to... We just want to love on you. We want to walk with you. We want to see you be totally free from, from those thoughts. The enemy has come and tried to lie and try to rob you. The, the Bible says the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. When we see suicide, that is a manifestation of the enemy killing people. Because he can't do it on his own. But if he can convince us, that's what he can do, friends. That's what he has the power to do today. He's been robbed of a lot of things. But he can lie. Here's the good news. As believers, we are not under those lies. 
We do not have to succumb to them. We do not have to listen. The Bible says take every thought into captivity and bring it into submission to Christ. That's not just changing the subject in your head. That's grabbing hold of it and saying, I am a son and you don't belong here. My dad's the creator of the universe and he says, I don't have to think about you anymore and I don't have to listen to those lies anymore about what you've said because he says something different about me. His thoughts toward me are like the, the sands. The sands. Individual purpose. I want to I wanna leave you today with some things to walk away with, not just to find these things. And because I think that each one of us, we're, we're hungry to discover these purposes, right? I know I am. We want to discover these purposes. So we've already laid out what the universal purpose is of the church and all the believers in it. And that is that we would glorify God through intimate relationship with him and bringing others into that intimate relationship. Now, you might have better wording than me on that, and you might be thinking, well, he's not including that part. Just, I get it. There's probably a better way to say it, but that's basically it. But how do we discover our focused purpose, and how do we discover our individual purpose? I want to give you just a few practical, a few practical ways today. First of all, I think the most pivotal step in discovering our purpose our focused purpose, our individual purpose, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I know you're probably hoping for something a little bit more tangible than that, but it is. It is tangible. It's very, it's for you. It's right here. Um, I don't want to hang out on this point too long. I know that Connor spoke a lot about the spirit inside of us and how we find freedom last week. But I do want to encourage you in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.25 says, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You know, I, I, I get this picture whenever, this is one of my favorite scriptures. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. It's, it's a picture of, I don't know if you did this when you were younger, maybe not, but walking on dad's feet. Walking around the house. It's not really you making it happen. You're just kind of just leaning in to the steps that dad's taking. And I also see it, it's like, you know, we've had a lot of snow lately. And it, and it is nice whenever an entire driveway or an entire way is, is, is snow blowed and it's like you can walk wherever and that's fine. But I don't think that's as much how our destiny is. I think it's a lot more like really deep snow that we've been having on the places that haven't been plowed. And God's come through <laughs> and he's made footholds just for us to step in. Just for us to step in. If we want to walk in that specific path that he has made for us, we must be in step with the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Inviting him into every part of your life, every part of your day. You're going into a difficult conversation, ask the Holy Spirit. You're, 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 you're trying to make a hard decision, ask the Holy Spirit. You've been racking your brain, you can't figure out the solution to this problem that you're having, ask the Holy Spirit. He's right there. He's the comforter. He's the advocate. He's the parakletos. He's the one who's close enough to make a call. That's what parakletos means. He's close enough. The Bible, um, there's a part where Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we look at that and we go, oh, don't be drunk. Well, it is saying that, good. But there's a deeper truth there, a much deeper truth. But be filled with the Spirit. See, it's hard to translate in English, but what he's really saying is be being filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. It's a continual feeling because when we go about this life, and we mature in Christ, which we're all called to mature in Christ, as, it's, as we were just seeing in Ephesians. He increases our capacity. And we're not meant to walk around as half full or half empty or even full full. We're meant to walk around in overflow, like what I talked about earlier. We are in need of a continual filling with the Holy Spirit. So before we get to any of these like practical things, that there are practical things, I encourage you. What does your relationship with the Holy Spirit look like? How often is he in the conversation of your mind? Secondly, we discover purpose by surrounding ourselves with people who are hungry for God's purposes in their life. And I'm not even really talking about coming to church, although good, come to church. Um, and by the way, that phrase doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, 
um, you are the church. Come to, come to when we gather, gather with the church. You are the church, you're the bride. The church is a, is a group of people. It's the believers, it's the body of Christ. But do that. But honestly, coming here and sitting here for an hour and a half once a week and worshiping and hearing the word taught is a beautiful thing. Continue to do it. It's a big part of how we continue to encounter God and we grow. But if you want to know the deep things, you have to go to the deep places. And an hour and a half once a week is not going to cut it. So there's this saying in the church we say, everyone needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a, a, a Timothy. A Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. What's meant by that? Everyone, we all need at least one person. It doesn't have to just be one. We need one person pouring into us. We need people that we can walk with as peers in this battle. And we need someone to pour into. I can't tell you. It is absolutely invaluable. You can't put a price tag on it to sit down with someone who's a few steps ahead of you and hear them share wisdom. And by the way, when you get that opportunity, it's good to not talk for some of it. Sometimes we find ourselves, we, 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 come, we come to someone, we meet with someone who has wisdom that we want wisdom from, and we spend the first 30 minutes trying to impress them with our wisdom. Just shut your mouth. And by the way, I'm preaching to me. Preaching to me. I sit down with these people that I want wisdom from, and then I share, and I use big words, and all of a sudden I'm like, why didn't I just listen? I asked to meet with them because I want to grab something from them. That's, that's for free. But it's not just about being mentored. It's about mentoring. It's about pouring into someone's life. If you haven't had this discovery yet, here's what you'll find. When you take a step out of the boat into mentoring someone else, um, you, mm, you're going to be amazed at how much you will discover about yourself. If you've ever been put in a situation where you have to teach, it's amazing how much more you learn when you have to teach something. I remember the first time I was invited to do a teaching on songwriting. And I had written many songs and I'd felt good about being able to write songs, but I went, I don't know how to write songs. I just do it. But when I forced myself to sit down and think through the way that I write songs, I was able, it, it wasn't just for them, it was for me. I learned how to write songs by being intentional about looking at the way that I wrote songs. When you pour into someone, you will be forced to examine the way you do things and you will learn more about yourself. You wanna discover your purpose? Step out of the boat. And by the way, this whole thing, I'm not ready. You will never be ready to mentor someone. You're never gonna be ready to go, I'm doing all these things well and that's why I have the authority to speak to you this way. Yeah. If you wait for that, you'll be dead. I mean, you'll, be, you'll pass on into heaven is what I mean, but you get what I mean. If you wait for that, you'll be in heaven. There'll be no one to mentor because we'll be in perfect revelation of Christ there. There'll be no wisdom to give, no counsel to give. You wanna wait for that? Too late. Heaven will be great for many things, but giving counsel will not be one that is needed. Okay. You got that one. Third, we discover purpose by drawing from our experience and our skill sets. What are you already doing? What are you already inclined, you're naturally inclined to do? What do you, what do you already like to do? You know, I think sometimes we look at the way we make money or our hobbies or our interests and we go, that's just natural. How could it be used for the kingdom of God? First of all, nothing is just natural. Nothing is just natural. Sometimes we walk around, I watched um, this movie, well, should I say that? <laughs> Anyways, I watched The Matrix the other night. I don't, I'm not endorsing it, okay? I'm not endorsing it. There's violence and it's, you know. But I'll say this. It was all these people. You, you, I don't know how much I want to explain this. Um, this. This earth was not the truest form of reality. There was actually this other deeper form of reality. And everyone was just kind of like plugged into these things. And then we, this was all just like a program. Now, I'm not saying that this life is a program. But what I am saying is this. The spiritual realm is the truest form of reality. I'll just say that. Like, we look at, we, we, we look at the, this empirical world and we go like, oh, this is real, but the spiritual world is kind of a maybe, kind of a, well, I hope it's there kind of thing. But that's the, that's the eternal being, is the spirit inside of you. So nothing is just natural. Nothing is just natural. God wants to use the things you're already doing. So if you work on computers, maybe you're supposed to pioneer a ministry where you help elderly people navigate their devices. That is such a need. 
And I'm not, I'm not p- pointing fun at, at elderly people at all. I'm just saying, I mean, wouldn't that be cool, elderly people? If you had people who are good at computers who could help you navigate your devices and use them to the full extent, I think that'd be amazing. Maybe you work on cars. Maybe you're supposed to get some other mechanics together and do free oil changes for single parents. Maybe you're an accountant or you work in finance and you're supposed to start a group that helps people steward their money. So often we, we belittle, we say, oh, that's just my career. That's what I do. So there's my work life and there's my ministry life. There's my this and there's my that. We categorize things that aren't meant to be categorized. It's all you. It's all what you're doing. There's, there's, there's overflow into the other parts. Those things that you're doing in the natural world that you're in, in order to earn your income and, or hobbies or interests, those things are meant to be used for the glory of God. If, you've ever read, if you haven't read the book, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, I encourage you to do that. It changed my life. It's my favorite book other than the Bible of all time. You can do everything other than sin to the glory of God. You can use it for kingdom purposes. We sit there and we go, how can you use this guy? And, and God's like going, it's right in front of you. You're already doing it. There's just more to be seen. There's, there's just another element. There's, another, there's a whole other realm of what you're already doing that can be used for the kingdom of God to draw from our experiences and our skill sets. Next, we discover purpose by reflecting on our pain. I'm not talking about wallowing in sin. I'm not talking about living in defeat, none of those things. But what I am saying is what, what if this, what if your most shameful memory or your biggest regret is the thing that God wants to use to see hundreds or even thousands of people walk in the victory that you are walking in. But if, but if you're afraid of it, you're going, oh, that's my past, I'm afraid of it, I'm afraid to use it. Let me just say this, God doesn't waste a thing. Some of you probably know the story of Joseph. In Genesis, he was betrayed by his brothers. He was lied about in a really rude and bad way by Potiphar's wife. He was forgotten in prison. He was just, uh, I almost used to work, I, no, it's ripped off over and over again, okay? But this is what he said at the end of the story. He looks at his brothers who are all like, oh my gosh, what's he gonna do? He has a lot of power. He says this. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Every pain that you've ever had, the enemy meant for evil. Oh yeah, he was trying to take you out. It's bad. God doesn't waste one ounce of it. He doesn't waste an ounce. You wanna discover your purpose, you're gonna have to reflect on your pain. Finally, we discover purpose through education and application. Okay, so um, I don't know about you, but it feels to me that our culture is kind of um, obsessed with uh, personality tests. I see them all over social media. You know, you got, you got the Disney themed personality test, you got the Lord of the Rings themed personality test, which I kind of like. Um, you got the Myers Briggs, you got the, the, the five voices, the 16 personalities, the, the disc assessment, assessment, the. And the list goes on and on and on. And I actually really like those things, they're really cool. Um, I think that they can be so useful for seeing how we tick and and what situations that we're most suited for. But if we're honest, how many times do we go and we take the abbreviated online version of the test, we read the little summary and we go, oh, that's cool, and then nothing. See, we believe that tools like that are much more effective when they're done in the context of a relationship where there's more intentional time walking through each person's specific path. And that's one of the major reasons why we are starting a course called Growth Track. Now, all of a sudden I feel like I'm in plug mode and it's like I'm gonna do an infomercial, but hear me out. Do I think it's gonna be a four week course? Do I think that you can completely discover your purpose and have the fullness of everything in a four week course? No, I don't think that. That's not what we're trying to say. But we're building this course in order to get you started or a kickstart wherever you are in your journey of discovering purpose. We, we want to help. So the first week is going to look like us telling about the, the history and the vision of Heart of the City so that you can decide if the path that you're on coincides with the path that the church is on. The second week, we're going to talk about your design. So what I talked about when I, when I was describing focused purpose we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna, there's, there's gonna be a, a spiritual gifts assessment and there's gonna be a personality profile. In week three, we're gonna talk about developing your leadership because we believe that every person was designed, every believer designed for influence. You know, sometimes we talk about there are leaders and there are followers. If you are a believer, you are a leader. 
I don't know if you all agree with me with that. I don't care. If you are a believer, you're a leader. Now, you're also a follower. We're followers of Christ. We're followers of those who go before us. We're followers of those who lead us, who we're under authority of. Yes, we're followers, but we're also, if you are a believer, you're meant to lead. You're meant to influence. You are meant to drive forward and have other people in your wake. As a believer, that's discipleship. Every one of us was meant for it. So we're going to talk about developing that. And then the fourth week, we're going to use everything that we discovered from the first three weeks to get you plugged in. What we say is on the right bus, on the right seat, going the right direction. We want to get you on a team fully functioning in the calling that God has for your life. Again, is a four-week class going to be the end-all, be-all of discovering your purpose? Absolutely not. Hopefully you guys know I've been spending the last 20 minutes talking about all the other ways. And, but there's, there's many ways even that I haven't even talked about. But we want to help kickstart you on that journey. So this is what I want to leave you with. We're going to be done. Um, we believe here that every person has a multifaceted purpose, a, a universal purpose, a focus. So universal purpose, remember, was the whole church, all believers, okay? The focused purpose expressed the gifts and passions. They're kind of a lane or a theme of your design and an individual purpose, what just you were made to do. Our, indivi- our, our universal purpose to glorify God in intimate relationship with him as sons and daughters and to bring others into that knowledge from an overflow of relationship with him. How we discover our focus, purpose, and our individual purpose, number one, day by day walk with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know, ask him. He's the source of all knowledge. He's much more reliable than Wikipedia. Two, being surrounded by people who are chasing after the purposes of God. You need someone pouring into. You need someone that you're running the race with and you need someone that you're pouring into. Number three, drawing from your life experience and skill sets, it's already sitting right in front of you. Perhaps not the fullness, but there's a good chance that a large part of your purpose is already sitting right in front of you within the natural inclinations and skill sets and life experiences that you already have. Fourth, reflect on your pain. See it redeemed for kingdom purposes and seeing other people set free and walk in victory. And finally, education and application, starting with growth track, but honestly, so much more.